Hi everyone, Mindflare Retro back, and something big has arrived in the mail. And it's come all the way to me from Germany, from none other than Jan Beta. Let's check it out. Now, if you've been following this video series, you know exactly what this is. It's Parafractics Retro Recipes Think Different Challenge where an Apple IIe, missing its innards, gets converted into a retro pie system called Apple Pie. In the event you haven't watched the first two parts of this video series, I highly recommend that you go back and watch Parafractic's initial video where he kicks off the whole project and then nominates Yan Beta to carry on. In Yan's part two video, he works as usual magic and as an international mod because ultimately some lucky subscriber is going to win this awesome apple pie system. Externally, this case is gorgeous. It's in really good condition. So let's pop off the lid and see what we have inside. We have a lot of packaging. That's a good sign. The Raspberry Pi itself is protected in its own bubble wrap and it looks to be in great condition. And we even have some bubble wrap supporting the keyboard from underneath. A quality packing job, Yan Beta. Now let's do a little survey of everything on the inside. Clearly others have been here before. Now I don't remember if this was removed from the hot glue in Yan's video or did it come off during shipping? And I also see that Yan's power supply has come loose from the bottom of the case as well. That hot glue does not want to seem to adhere very well to the metal. And similarly with the USB hub, it's not sticking to the metal. There's plenty of hot glue, but no sticky sticky. Yeah, even the Raspberry Pi board isn't stuck down anymore. I mean, there is hot glue here. Now my other concern is we don't have any kind of insulating layer on the bottom of the board to protect it from maybe shorting against the metal case. The bottom of the PCB can touch the bottom of the metal case easily. Same thing here with the keyboard adapter. And these solder joints protrude a bit more so there's a greater risk for something to short out against the metal. I'm gonna have to do something about this. And the temporary solution, blue tack. So my thinking is I'm gonna apply little strips of blue tack all along the exposed solder joints, like so. not only insulating the bottom of the PCBs from accidentally shorting out, but also allowing me to adhere them to the bottom of the case. I'm using this as a temporary measure only while I work on my part of the project. Very nice. This is working out quite well. And now that we have a more stable working environment, it's time to fish in an HDMI cable and get this RetroPie booted up. Right, so everything's secured. We have all the necessary cables plugged in and I'm gonna flip the switch and power it up. What? No signal. Well, the Raspberry Pi has power, but the activity light isn't flashing, so I guess it's not reading the SD card therefore not booting. And yes, I am on the right input, but still no signal. Ugh, I have to research this. Annoying. I don't know what's going on here. 
I did read on one of the Raspberry Pi support forums that sometimes the HDMI output from the Raspberry Pi board isn't compatible with certain monitors or displays, and you have to actually edit the config.txt file and force some settings, which will enable HDMI output. I tried this and tested on two different monitors and no dice, it still doesn't work. And if you haven't figured it out yet, I am not a Raspberry Pi expert. In fact, this is the first time I've ever held one. And another form suggested to check the SD card and make sure that it was inserted fully and making good contact. Visually, everything looks to be fine with the SD card and with the pin contacts. There does seem to be some minor wear on the contact pads of the SD card and the pin contacts of the SD card slot on the Raspberry Pi board seem to be okay, but I guess it wouldn't hurt to polish them up a little bit. If you've seen any of my previous videos, you'll know that I like to use this trusty old typewriter ink eraser to polish up contact pads. It does a pretty good job. It's also a good little tool for some precision polishing. And speaking of precision polishing, I think I'm going to give these contact pads on the SD card a little scrub as well. And going one step further, I always keep a little bit of Deoxit D5 that I spray into a little bottle that I have. And I'm going to use a Q-tip to apply the deoxid to all the contacts to clean off any residual oxidation that I can't see. All the contacts are now nice and shiny. I'm going to reinsert the SD card. Seems to be a good fit and we'll power it up. I have a good feeling about this one. Fingers are crossed. Oh, for the love of sh**. So apparently this is turning into a Raspberry Pi troubleshooting video. Upon further research, I do believe it actually is an issue with the SD card slot. And people have reported boot problems with this very early model Raspberry Pi board. And the issue seems to be the form factor of this particular SD card slot. When an SD card is inserted, it's only held in place by two narrow ridges along either side. There's no other force across the head of the card, allowing better contact with more downward pressure. So I think over time, with heat and just the age of the SD card itself, there ends up being some kind of a bowing effect, and the pin contact becomes unstable. With only these two thin edges across the side holding the card in place, and no support at all across the center, there's even cases of these narrow edges actually snapping off from the card slot. So I got the bright idea that I was actually going to replace this card slot with a better one. I did find a fully covered metal design that would offer perfect support across the top. But in order to speed things along, I thought I'd try out something a little simpler first. Yep, Kapton tape applied to the edge of the SD card. I did read that some people tried this method and it did work for them adding just enough additional thickness, increasing the downward force and improving the connection stability when inserted into the card slot. Okay, let's insert it again. Oh, yeah, that is definitely a tighter fit. It seems a lot more secure in there. Hopefully the connection is better. Okay, I'm going to plug everything in and power it up again. Hopefully it works. Here we go. Oh, that's new. Oh, and I see a raspberry. Oh, working. Ah, hello, RetroPie. Ta-da! Huh, phew. Well, thanks for watching, everybody. See you soon.
No, don't be silly. This is Parafractic's Think Different Challenge. Don't go anywhere. Jeez, I hope I didn't lose anybody. Okay, so let's recap what this challenge is all about. Back in the first video, Parafractic acquired for himself an empty Apple II case, installed a Raspberry Pi single board computer, which is running RetroPie, a retro games and console emulator. Chef Perry even enhanced the flavor of this RetroPie system with some additional ingredients that make it more fun to use, like a sound adapter, a keyboard adapter to use the original Apple IIe keyboard, and game pads. He dubbed his creation Apple Pie. He then challenged none other than Yan Beta to kick it up a notch. And of course, Yan did not disappoint. He added an internationally compliant power supply so that this Apple Pie can be used anywhere in the world. And to my surprise, Yan Beta nominated little old me to further enhance this fusion retro contemporary computer. So, what to do, what to do? Well, I do have a certain something sitting on a shelf. It tends to be a noisy thing when it's running. I haven't used it in over 20 years, so I'm not even sure if it works. But, it would be pretty cool if I could use one of these blank spaces in the back to plug it into. Hmm. So, what I'm thinking is, Parallel port printer. Not only would it be cool to get a parallel port printer working with the Apple Pie, but also to get it to plug in natively to a 25 pin parallel port in the case of the Apple Pie. None of this USB rubbish. Now, how do we get a traditional parallel printer cable to plug into a Raspberry Pi? Nowadays, printers are plugged in with a USB cable, assuming we're not using wireless or LAN. So how in the heck are we going to get parallel to play nice with the USB of the Raspberry Pi? And no, sorry Raspberry Pi aficionados, we are not going to be using any of the general purpose input-output lines of the Pi itself. We are sticking with USB. A parallel port interface uses a 25-pin plug, called a DB25. Eight of the 25 pins can be used for data input. Each data line sends one bit of information. The data bit signals are transmitted simultaneously in parallel across the eight data lines equaling one byte of data. And in a nutshell, USB uses a much more sophisticated method to transmit its data over only two wires and can do so at very high transfer rates. Okay, now that we know that, all we need to do is build a simple circuit and maybe a small PCB that can convert the parallel port data signal to the more contemporary USB data signals and interface between a DB25 plug and a USB-A plug. Thankfully, people smarter than me have already designed such a gizmo. Look at that, that's perfect. Excellent, that's exactly what we're looking for. So, all we need to do is download the Gerber files and away we go. This is going to be fun. Yeah, we're not doing that. We're doing this. Oh, look, someone has already designed and sells such an adapter on Amazon. Go figure. And how convenient, we have so many to choose from. Here we have USB to 36 pin Centronics, but that would be for plugging into the printer directly from the Raspberry Pi. This is closer to what we're after, a DB25 male, but this has male locking screws. That's not what we're after. We need something that has female locking screws, like this one. It has the correct DB25 plug and female locking screws. Let's take a closer look. Ah, hello, my little blue friend. You have the correct plug and you have the correct connectors that I'm looking for. Brilliant, sold. Now hurry up and get here. My little blue friend has arrived. Let's open it up and check it out. Well, here it is in all its blue translucent glory. This is exactly what we're looking for. You can see the little converter circuit board embedded in there. Looks pretty simple and certainly much easier than making my own. So the idea is to pop off one of these covers and install the little adapter plug from inside, 
so that it sticks outside and any old school parallel printer cable can plug into it. So I want to use the same mounting method that Parafractic used here on mine. So what I'm going to do is unscrew these jack screws, insert the plug through the back of the case, and reconnect the jack screws to hold everything in place. Oh, come on. Seriously? So if it's not one hurdle, it's another. These jack screws are embedded into the plastic. So I cannot get them out without damaging everything. So failure is not an option. So I went looking for a gender changer with male on one side, female on the other. It would fit here and the adapter would plug into the back of it and bingo bango, Bob's your uncle. However, I could not find an all-in-one male and female gender changer. So in the newly revised plan, I will connect these two individual male and female gender changers together in line with the adapter and everything will work. Puzzle time, boys and girls. Yeah, so the screws are like a fraction of a millimeter too short. So I'm going to try to file off this tiny little bit of metal here. And hopefully that will give us just the space we need for the screw thread to catch. Filing is complete. Let's try this again. And this time I'm going to start things off with a screwdriver pushing as well. I can feel it catching. Finally. The gender changer conga line is in place and it looks pretty good. Yeah, well, looking pretty is one thing, but getting this port to actually work is quite another. From what I understand, just getting any printer, a USB printer, to work with Linux, which the RetroPie is based upon, is going to be a challenge in itself. So now we have to do some prerequisite work on the Linux side of things. And here we are in RetroPie. In order for Linux to detect and work with any attached printers, we need to install a print server service called CUPS. But the administration of CUPS is performed through a web browser. So we need to install a desktop first that includes a web browser. This is not a Linux tutorial, so I'm going to skip all of the nitty gritty details on how this is being done. But suffice it to say, it does take a while, so we're just going to skip through all the really boring stuff. Now upon reboot, we should have a desktop installed. Access to that desktop should now appear here in RetroPie as a new feature under Ports, Desktop. So we click Select, and our desktop launches. Back on my regular desktop, I'm just going to show you the CUPS website, cups.org. This explains everything about CUPS. We're not going to download and install CUPS from here. We're actually going to do it back on the RetroPie from the terminal on our desktop, Linux style. Back on the RetroPie desktop, we're going to launch the terminal program and install CUPS via the command line. 
Cups is actually new to me and I learned how to do this from the Explaining Computers YouTube channel. A great channel, you should check it out. I'll post a link in the description. Back on my workbench, I have unpacked and set up my good old trusty Star Micronics NX2410 24-pin dot matrix printer. Whew, that was a mouthful. I have not used this printer in over 20 years, so hopefully it still works. This is our printer cable that connects into our newly installed parallel printer port at the rear of the Apple Pie. This is the Centronics 36 pin parallel printer port on the printer that the other end of our printer cable will plug into. And because I'm so confident that everything's going to work, I'm going to load a piece of paper. And yes, the printer adapter is also plugged into the USB hub. Back on the RetroPie desktop, you'll see that I've spruced things up a little bit with some custom wallpaper. The Cups print server did install successfully, so that's good. And to access it, we need to launch our browser and go to its admin page. We start off at the Cups landing page and we want to click on adding printers and classes. This is where you can manage print jobs, printers, etc. In our case, we want to add a new printer. If the Raspberry Pi is plugged into a network, it will detect any network accessible printers and display them here. But in our case, unknown is our little blue device that's connected locally. We want to select that and click continue. This is the part where you add a printer name and on the next screen is where you actually select the printer that you have plugged in to the parallel port. And that's where things get tedious. I literally spent numerous dizzying hours trying different printers, different drivers, reading manuals, setting dip switches. Nothing would print. I really was at my wit's end. I was quite convinced that this wasn't going to work at all. This parallel port thing was going to be a massive failure. But then I just happened to come across some generic drivers for 24 pin dot matrix printers. Quiet you. Finally, success. I printed off several more test pages and I'm happy to say that everything turned out pretty well, especially for a printer that's this old. I think the print head might be failing. You can see some sloppy text there. And the fact that the ribbon still prints dark, that's amazing in itself. This really was a maximum effort for me, mostly because I was really outside my comfort zone. I've never touched a Raspberry Pi before and I've only dabbled here and there with Linux over the years. And I realize some of you must be thinking, well you didn't really get the Apple emulator to print. No, I didn't, but I have a feeling that would be a whole other can of worms to open up. But I would like to think that I did lay a decent foundation for any of the emulators on the RetroPie to be able to print from the parallel port, like they would have back in the day. So with that, I think it's time to sign the case. And as I prepare to close her up, I'm thinking, you know what, there is room for further improvement here, especially when it comes to properly securing all the parts, not to mention cable management. Sleep tight, you're off to your next destination. I suppose that's it for my part. I've accomplished what I wanted to, kinda. If any Raspberry Pi or RetroPie experts are watching and you have experience printing from any of the emulators, I'd be really interested in hearing about that, so please leave comments below. You know what, as I look at this, another idea comes to mind. Hmm, I'll be right back.
Here is the complete Apple Pie kit that I will be sending along. It will include a parallel port printer cable, spare Apple Pie vinyl decal stickers, of course the new controllers with Apple Pie labels, and there's going to be two SD cards. This is the original card from Parafractic. One thing I didn't mention earlier is that when I was adding prerequisites to the RetroPie installation, I actually ran out of space on the original SD card. So I had to get an 8 gig SD card and then perform all my mods there. So there will be two SD card options for whoever ends up with this Apple Pie rig. Parafractic's original 4 gig card and my 8 gig card with parallel port mods. My modded 8 gig card I will leave installed in the Raspberry Pi. Oh yes, Yan Beta's Apple stickers will be passed along as well. And that concludes my contribution to the very first Think Different Challenge. I want to thank Yan Beta for nominating me, thank you very much. And I want to thank Perry Fractic for coming up with this whole crazy idea. This was a challenge for me in many parts, and very frustrating in parts as well. But in the end, the project got done, I learned a lot, and I had a lot of fun. So that's what counts. But there's always room for improvement. So. Before I send this apple pie back to you, Parafractic, do you think there's anyone else I could send it to just to add the finishing touches to bring it all home? Thank you so much, Mindflare Retro and Yan Beta as well. What both of you have done with this machine, I couldn't have even dreamt of. And uh, it's really taking shape in mind blowing ways. Yeah, that hurt. Uh, but I think there is still room to take this to one extra level. Kind of like I did when I put a Nintendo Wii inside there and called it the Apple II Wii. Yeah, don't need that anymore. I, I, I was going to put it on eBay. Oh, I'll list it as is. Now, as for who can take this through the finish line in unique style, we have had some suggestions and one name keeps coming up. It's the 9-bit, sorry, 8-bit guy. Uh, I haven't heard of them, I'm guessing they have a few hundred subscribers and uh, obviously are up for the challenge. So whoever you are, wherever you are, uh, nine, uh, sorry, 8-bit guy, <laughs> uh, we hereby officially nominate you for Perifractic's Think Different Challenge. What do you say? Hi Perifractic, uh, thanks for the nomination. Yeah, I do actually have some ideas for the apple pie for some possible improvements that could be made to it. Uh, plus with a small channel like mine, I could always use a few extra subscribers. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll accept the challenge. Brilliant, thank you so much for accepting. I'm just loading up your channel here. Hey, you're not a small channel. You have 711,000 subscribers. Thank you so much for accepting my challenge, um, Your Royal Highness. Uh, Mind Flare Retro, take it over. Uh, okay, so I will send it off to the 8 bit guy. This is going to be so cool. Okay, I'm finally done here. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, please remember I've included a PayPal donation link in the description of all my videos. So if you happen to find yourself in a giving mood and want to show your appreciation for this video, or maybe you wish to support my regular Commodore computer repair efforts, then please consider a donation to this channel. Okay people, I am out of here. I want to thank you all once again for watching this video. Also, thanks again to Parafractic and Yan Beta for including me in this fantastic challenge. And don't forget to keep an eye on the 8-Bit Guys channel for part 4 of the Think Different Challenge. And thank you very much to all my new subscribers. After Yan Beta's last video, I had a huge surge in subscriptions. 
Thank you all very much for taking an interest in my channel. And a final big thanks to the generous people that made donations over the past few videos, including some unexpectedly very generous donations. Don't forget to comment, like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for your time, and we'll see you again soon. And I want to thank Parafractic Retro Recipes. Parif pa, 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 pa.